Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by McClintock and Associates. My name is Mike Weary, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. I want to thank everyone for attending, as I would have never have guessed we would still be at this 13 months later. Today's webinar will be focused on the recently released HERF audit guide and what it means for your school. We'll cover the important aspects of the guide, specifically information on the audit thresholds and timing, testing and implications of the Uniform Guidance Code of Federal Regulations, and the Reporting and Corrective Action Plan. We're sharing this guidance as part of our vision to be the thought leader providing consulting and compliance solution to institutions so schools can change, schools can focus on changing their students' lives. Normally, I'm a presenter um, for these presentations, but today I have the pleasure of moderating, and my colleague Ted Blenderman is one of the presenters. Ted is a shareholder director and our resident technical guru. As Ted and I were preparing for the audit guide, we realized the need for external experts. As a result, we reached out to Jana Rust and Scott Goldschmidt, both attorneys with Thompson Coburn, to join us in today's presentation. Thompson Coburn had the foresight to circulate information in 2020 about schools needing to comply with the uniform guidance regulations, which has come to fruition in this audit guide. Scott and his attorney specialize in higher education, and Jana is an expert in government contract regulation. Their backgrounds bring a high level of knowledge to this subject matter, which includes increasing my personal understanding. As an FYI, the software will only reflect three videos at one time, so I, I will be going to audio only, and you'll see Jana throughout the presentation. I will be bouncing in and out occasionally, audio, asking audio questions, but you will see all three presenters. Before we begin, we do have a few housekeeping items for you. Remember that this information is not legal or regulatory advice. Some of the commentary is our interpretation or best guidance, which may not apply in every situation. So as always, please consult your personal advisors for your schools. We encourage you to participate in the polls that will pop up from time to time throughout the presentation. These polls allow us to bring, allow us to bring you the most relevant content in our webinars blog articles, and other supporting material we provide to, to proprietary institutions. Also, please feel free to ask questions right within the webinar tool in the panel that says chat in the right-hand corner of your screen. We do anticipate a lot of questions today, so please know that we'll be actively organizing them as they come through. If some questions can be wrapped into one, we will likely combine them. We will address as many questions as we can during and at the end of the presentation. If you miss anything today, we will be recording the event and the recording file and presentation will be made available in the next few days to all who have registered and attended. Both Thompson Coburn and McClintic have COVID-19 resource pages on their respective websites that houses previous webinars and blog articles. McClintock has resources that cover the Paycheck Protection Program, preparing for the new lease standard and other topics, and Thompson Coburn has their education series that covers a variety of topics. With that, let's get into the presentation. As an overview, what we're covering today are four main items. We're gonna cover audit thresholds and timing, which will be covered by Ted. We'll then jump to Scott, who's gonna go through the audit testing implications of the CFR provisions. This is basically the six areas we're required to test in the audit guide. We'll then uh, turn it over to Jana, who's gonna dive into some of the procurement suspension and debarment regulations, what I referred to as the uniform code, um, what you've heard as the two CFR 200 regulations, which is probably the area most people on this call have the least experience with. And then we're gonna come back to Ted to talk briefly about audit reports and the corrective action plans before we open it up to questions and answers from the group. Uh, so before we begin, in, begin, we have a polling question And the polling question is, did your institution utilize the published ED guidance when expending the HERF grants? Please answer one for yes or answer two for no. I'm waiting to see if uh, those results be, be accumulating um, as they come through, it's just to, to see how many of you have utilized ED's guidance as trying to spend the HERF funds. 
few answers coming in. All right, so at this point, Ted, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about audit thresholds and timing. Okay, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, so just want to discuss some of the uh, audit thresholds, some timing, and just some other things to be considering as we go through the presentation today. As far as the audit thresholds are concerned, uh, it's based on each main OPID number. And if you're an organization uh, or an ownership structure that has multiple IDs, it's based on each individual OPID number, not the uh, OPID uh, numbers in the aggregate. So based on that, each OPID each OPEID number is subject to the audit if your total HERF expenditures exceed $500,000, unless you're on uh, heightened cash monitoring one or heightened cash monitoring two uh, during any part of the fiscal year. When we talk about the HERF expenditures, that doesn't necessarily mean the uh, amounts that you have actually drawn down from the um, uh, federal government. It's what you have actually expended. So it's possible that you might have drawn down, say, $600,000, but only expended $450,000. So the audit requirement is based on the $450,000 amount, not the $600,000 uh, amount. And then uh, when we talk about uh, expenditures, we're talking about both the institutional expenditures as well as the student grants. And then in future audits, the $500,000 threshold will also include HERF II and HERF III funds. The due date of the uh, audit, um, it's 120 days after the audit guide was, was issued. Um, that will be uh, July 29th of 2021. Uh, this will be, uh, so if you have fiscal year ends between April 30th of 2020 through December 31st, 2020, the deadline is July 29th of 2021. Uh, you can submit it earlier, or you can as well submit it with your annual compliance audits that would be due uh, June 30th of 2020. Uh, the audits are submitted via uh, easy audit. Um, if you do not submit it with your normal uh, submission, then you have to submit it through uh, easy audit through uh, the stub audit submission um, portion and you have to indicate it that it's for the HERF grant uh, audits. And then for any subsequent fiscal years, the due date will be your institution's annual submission uh, deadline. So as we go through some of the best practices and be thinking about these things as we go through the presentation today, uh, you should be ensuring that you, you have your supporting documentations, policy and procedures and reports uh, that they're thoroughly complete and accurate in advance of uh, the audit being performed. It's especially important as far as the supporting documentation is concerned as it relates to your quarterly reports that you've submitted, as well as the annual report. For the policies and procedures, um, you just want to be certain as we go through these presentations, think about those areas where maybe you have not uh, documented very well of the policies and procedures that you've used with regard to the expenditures that you've had with your per fund money. In addition, you want to start reviewing the uh, guide and begin to gather any information that might be necessary. And just remember that just because you might not be required to have an audit, that doesn't uh, relieve you from any potential review or audit by Ed officials. So that means it's important that you still have the supporting documentation policies and procedures in place and to be certain that they're completely accurate as well. Uh, some of the general requirements that we as auditors have, we have to consider internal controls over the HERF grants to help assess what we call our audit risk. And this, this assessment of internal controls must be done for each of the six compliance requirements. And we'll be getting into those six requirements uh, further in our presentation. We can also leverage off of the uh, internal controls that um, your auditor or we as McClinic and Associates have done uh, as it relates to the audited financial statements that we have prepared. Something that's gonna be different uh, with regard to our uh, performance of the audits is the concept of materiality. 
One, it has to be defined for each of the six compliance requirements. Now, the guide does not define what materiality is uh, for us, but it should be based on qualitative and wherever applicable quantitative factors. Now, this is very different from the materiality concept that's used for the preparation of financial statements, which typically is based on the uh, quantitative uh, factors that are involved. So again, we have to define materiality in each of these six compliance requirements. When it comes to the testing that's going to be done, um, there are samples that we're going to have to perform in certain areas. Uh, one, as it relates to student grants, and two, as it relates to the institutional expenditures. Now, the guide doesn't define what uh, the minimum sample sizes uh, should be, which which is very different from the uh, financial aid audits that are performed where the uh, audit guide for those compliance audits defines what uh, the sample sizes should be. So we'll be uh, relying on our professional uh, judgment as it relates to those standards. So for student grants, we're going to be testing uh, more likely than not uh, 60 students for populations greater than 250. So it's I say more likely that's the size of our sample size because we don't anticipate any of our institutions to be less than 250 unless you are on uh, heightened cast monitoring. And then regardless, um, an audit would have to be done regardless of the amount of expenditures that you have. And as far as the institutional expenditures are concerned, we're going to um, determine what materiality is, uh, select uh, expenditures that are greater than uh, what we consider to be material, uh, judgmentally select those items, and then any of the remaining, we're going to be uh, doing a uh, sample population. So those are just some of the highlights and uh, general requirements and audit thresholds and, and timing that we would have. So I'm going to turn it back to Mike. So Ted, one question. I know in some of the association webinars that the OIG was on, there were a couple questions that came from the sector about the audit guide and, and was it kind of being unfair to, to for-profit schools. And so we, we took a look and compared it to kind of the audit requirements in, in this area for non-profit institutions. I want to kind of give our high level mm -hmm. uh, assessment of how they're comparable. No, oh, sure. Well, uh, primarily they're very consistent. Um, in the sense that um, the six compliant requirements to be tested are required both for nonprofit and for-profit entities. The same CFRs are applicable for both the nonprofit and the for-profit entities. I'd say that uh, the main difference that you would see is how it's reported. Uh, for nonprofit institutions, they submit it as part of their uh, reporting package under the Uniform Guidance Audit Standards. And for the uh, proprietary sector, there's a separate audit report that needs to be issued. Another minor difference, but they're very similar, is the amount of the threshold for the testing that needs to be done. Uh, as the audit guide indicates, uh, the threshold is 500,000 for proprietary institutions. For nonprofit institutions, and not getting into a lot of the details, basically the threshold is 750,000. So it's very similar as far as the dollar amounts that are, are being concerned. So at this point, we're gonna turn it over to Scott to talk through the audit testing and the implications of the CFR provisions. Basically, kind of the audit requirements that the guide asked us to go through. And, and I know Scott is logging back in right now. He was just texting me saying he somehow, his computer froze, so he's logging in right now. Um, if you want, Mike, if it's easier for me to do my discussion before Scott hops back in, I'm happy to do that, but I, I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> um, yeah, why don't we do that? Why don't we go ahead and, in fact, we do those two out of order. To me, it's not a big deal. So why don't we go ahead and start with section three. I realize there has been some software errors people are saying. So we'll, we'll go to your section, section three, and we'll come back to Scott. All right. I'll go ahead and advance the slides out up there. All right. Oh, it looks like actually Scott may be coming on right now. <laughs> of course, as soon as I do that. Um, although I'm not seeing anyone. All right. 
think everything should be ready. Um, are you, are you seeing the, the correct slide there, Mike? Yes. Okay. I see it. I see it. Perfect. Um, so uh, as Mike mentioned, I'm going to talk about the procurement and suspension and debarment requirements from um, the, the higher ed audit requirements. And these are things that, you know, I, I don't want to say it was a footnote, but in the award documents, you know, it require um, entities agreed to comply with 2 CFR 200. And part of that are, there's a section in 2 CFR 200 that deals with procurement. And that part of 2 CFR 200, which is sometimes referred to as the uniform grant guidance, the super circular, um, I forget, there's a couple of other names for it, but I just usually use the numbers 2 CFR 200. But those requirements on procurement really reflect the idea that whoever is spending government funds that they get through a grant here, such as the HERF awards, these um, funds, when you spend them on contracts, you're really spending taxpayer money. And the dollars there need to reflect that you're spending taxpayer money. And so it needs to be used effectively and efficiently. Um, you know, the government wants these procurements to be open to anybody to compete for. It shouldn't be just a subset of, you know, the grant awardees, friends or contacts. And the government also has a number of other policies that they try to achieve through these pr procurement requirements. And there's really, you know, I think about um, six of the, let me do the math, actually eight of these, sorry, that are called out in the procurement um, regulations. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those in detail as we go through these. So really the procurement suspension and debarment regulations, the key requirements are going to be the ones in 2 CFR 200.318 through 326. Now, some of you guys, if you aren't familiar with the 2 CFR 200 requirements before, um, you know, all this guidance came out, if you go and look at some of the current government websites with um, 2 CFR 200 on it, you're probably going to see um, procurement standards that cover up to .327. And that's because in August and November of last year, the government updated these regulations. Generally, though, the regulations that were in effect at the time of an award are the ones that apply. So really, and this is going to make it a little more difficult for some folks who are still trying to figure out maybe what they should have been doing. But you, you're going to want to look at the regulations that were in effect back when you signed your HERF award agreement. And at that time, the procurement standards only covered 318 through 326. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. We won't be talking about there's um, a, at least one more that was added since then. Um, we're not going to be talking about it since it should not apply to your award. But we'll start with 318. And that's the basic requirement that an entity that is, has federal funds and is going to be spending it through procurements needs to have procurement procedures that are followed and these need to be written. So that's kind of the baseline standard. And that is something that I understand that the HERF audit guide requires the auditors to look for. Um, the next thing that's required by these procurement standards in 2 CFR 200 is that the procurements are done using full and open competition consistent with the standards that are set out in um, 2 CFR 200.320, which we're going to talk about. But I don't want to get you guys lost in the numbers. I feel like I'm using a lot of the numbers. But the idea here is that the government wants these procurements done in a way that allows the most number of folks to compete for these contracts. And because of that, then there's going to be certain limitations on what can be done with those federal funds. So there might be limitations as far as competitive pricing, unreasonable restrictions. Um, you can't have excessive bonding requirements. The technical requirements must be clear and accurate so that anybody who does want to compete fully knows what they'd be competing uh, to provide. Um, you can't have pre-qualification lists unless those lists are open to um, um, contractors to get on during the time of the competition. So you can't say, well, we've already vetted these six vendors previously, that those are the only ones who can com 
can compete. The idea is to let everyone compete. And so, you know, there's there are those prohibitions that basically the government has said when you compete out these contracts, you can't um, be doing these things. So then the next section in 2 CFR 200 is about methods of procurement. So this um, part of the um, procurement standards really sets out what the the types of ways a an entity that has federal awards can procure um, goods and services. The most basic is the micro purchase threshold, or I'm sorry, the micro purchase, and that has a ceiling. Um, of $10,000. And so that, and then we'll talk about small purchases here in a moment. Both of those are what we call informal solicitations, and they both have ceilings that the entity can go up to, but they may set thresholds that are lower than that. So the micro purchase ceiling threshold is going to be $10,000. Some entities um, may still have a threshold that is much lower than that, such as $3,000 or $5,000. I suspect, though, for most institutes, um, institutions that were just getting procurement policies and procedures in place um, following their HERF award, most of them are probably just used the ceilings that were in the regulations. So $10,000 for micro purchases and then um, $250,000 for small purchases. And so if you followed the micro purchase method of procurement, that basically meant that you could go out and find a vendor to provide what you needed as long as the aggregate of your purchase was under $10,000. And that meant you didn't have to have something that was as full and open of competition as what we're going to talk about with some of these other types of procurement. So, you know, you could go to, for instance, Amazon and buy $9,000 of whatever it is that you needed. Um, that would have been a micro purchase. And the idea is, you know, it needs to be truly a um, purchase under that threshold. You can't break down and day, you know, on Thursday, buy something for $9,000 and then the next day go back and buy something else for $9,000. Um, that's the exact same thing where you've just split it into two. It really needs to be um, to, um, purchases that are under those thresholds. And then you also have to try to um, distribute your purchases amongst qualified vendors. There is a little bit of difference in language between the old regulations um, and the ones that were changed in 2020, but you, the, um, you, the HERF award, um, awardees needed to be distributing those purchases um, to the extent possible. So if you have something though that's above the $10,000 threshold, and then you're going to make a small purchase. That threshold, again, is $250,000. And those purchases can be done on, on something a little less formal than what we're going to talk about it in a moment. And all you have to do for a small purchase is get three uh, or an adequate number of quotes from qualified vendors. And generally, that's going to be somewhere two to three quotes of rates or prices. But that's really the extent of what you have to do there. You know, reach out to these vendors um, and get two to three quotes or rates for, from them. And you don't have to award the um, contract based on the price. It could be based on other criteria. But if you did award the contract based on something other than price, you needed to explain why you did that. And so it could be you know, vendor A was offering something for $100,000, vendor B was offering something for $125,000, but vendor B could guarantee that it would be there in time for, you know, classes to start, whereas vendor A said they, you know, weren't sure about their supply chain. So that just needed to be document, that just needs to be documented if you use the small purchase um, procedures. Then beyond the small purchase threshold, anything above $250,000 should be done in something that's a more formal procurement, which would be um, a request for proposals or an invitation for bids. And so an invitation for bids is going to be the type of procurement where you request um, vendors to submit bids, um, what we would call a sealed bid uh, uh, kind of idea. And they would submit bids to you and the decision would be made on price alone on who to award. 
in the request for pro um, proposals type scenario, though, there could be other factors that the institution would consider in the award. So it could be the performance history of the entity, the um, the skills of the, the personnel who's going to be performing the work. But those are the types of procurement methods that would need to be used for any purchase above $250,000 or whatever the small purchase threshold is that the institution has selected. And um, the, the two CFR 200 requirements for those types of procurements would need to be followed. And there's a number of different types of requirements regarding the time frame for publishing those um, procurements or solicitations and then the types of contracts that could be awarded. But those are generally the main types of um, methods for procurement, except for the last one that we'll talk about, which I think a number of institutions probably used particularly early on, which is a non-competitive non procurement. And that's where the procurement is not open to anyone and everyone to submit a bid or offer on. It's where the institution would have gone to a single entity and requested a bid or offer um, to perform the work or provide the goods. It's um, to award this kind of, or, or to use this kind of method for procurement, the entity though would need to, the entity being the institution would need to um, follow certain um, requirements as far as it's, it's only allowed in certain instances. There's really four instances in which it's allowed, but I think the most common ones that would have been used for these HERF awards are going to be um, the good or services available from only one vendor or that there was a public exigency or emergency um, where there could not be a delay in publicizing the solicitation such that um, that would justify using this one source. And I will say that both of those and in particular the public exigency requirement are going to be very subjective um, decisions by the institutions as far as justifying them. But then it's also going to be, I think, very subjective by the auditors and the Department of Education when they are reviewing these as well, as far as whether or not th those existed. But that is one of the justifications that can be used for um, not competing out a solicitation. And then a couple of the other requirements are um, in, um, 321 and which requires using minority businesses, women's business enterprises, and labor surplus area firms when possible. There's also requirements regarding bonding. Um, there's also some requirements regarding the cost and um, price um, analysis for the procurements, but these are kind of the big ones that I think some of the ones that we were just talking about are the big ones that are going to appear, I think, in the audits. And then, you know, that were defined in 318 through 326 of 2 CFR 200. The last thing I think that is on my list to talk about is suspension and debarment. And the federal regulations prohibit grant recipients from awarding contracts to um, um, entities that are suspended, debarred, or otherwise excluded from receiving certain types of federal funds. And th this ex um, requirement applies to any type of covered transactions. So a procurement contract under a grant, such as a HARF award, would be considered a covered transaction. So under the, this federal requirement, um, HARF award recipients should have been checking SAM, the System for Award Management, to determine if any of their vendors, if the contracts were over $25,000, um, to see if those vendors were are on the exclusion lists that are on SAM, or they could have been requesting a certification from their vendors to confirm that they are not on these ex exclusion lists, or they could be including a contract term in their um, solicitations and contracts. That was one of the that is one of the requirements from the two CFR 200 requirements that incorporate another part of two CFR. But the, that was something that came up um, 
that is part of the procurement standards and that is something that it appears Department of Education is requiring the audit auditors to look for as they go through and review this. So I think those go through the main points um, for me, unless Mike, you had anything else? Thanks, Jana. Just to let everyone know, we, we realize there's been some server and connectivity issues. It's been with the host of the software. So uh, we'll consider if we need to rebroadcast this once we get the recording done, but the recording will be available for the, anyone that's been able to come on or off. Um, and so we'll get that sent out. And if we if we think we need to re-record it, we can regroup and talk about that. So we appreciate everyone hanging in there. Um, so before we go back to Scott, the cover section too, Jana, just a couple thoughts on Am I correct? I think if schools want to check the SAM system for suspension department, that the, the audit guide indicates how to do that. I think it has the link in the audit guide, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, and I think I know I'm not familiar with that, and a lot of our institutions aren't, but I believe it's, it's there and I think fairly straightforward. Am I correct? Yeah, so um, SAM.gov, www.sam.gov allows the public to look for entities listed <clears throat> in um, on the exclusion list. And basically you can look at their full profile that they would have there. And not every company is going to be listed there, which is fine. So if you go were to go look for, um, you know, MikeWorry.com and his company didn't show up, that's fine because he's not on the list. <laughs> um, the problem is, you know, if, JanaRust.com, you know, that company shows up on the list and you've still awarded a contract to, to her company. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you go there, you should easily be able to find the company information by searching the records there and basically just typing in the company name. Yeah, and from our discussions, I think obviously I think the probably the more commercial vendor you're using and larger is probably less risk than a one-off vendor, but you should be checking anyone over it to just, there's certainly a risk level of who could be on there and not. The other question, Dana, just from your experience with federal grants, from the unusual nature of how these funds were issued, and normally federal grants are applied for. In this case, the government just kind of, the Congress allocated this money, ED got it out to schools quickly. The guidance kind of came later. Do you have any sense of, the, of any leniency ED may have of someone that spent the money allowably that Scott's going to get into, but maybe you didn't document it? Cor correctly and assuming the intent was good this isn't fraud this isn't abuse do you have any sense of the, their leniency they may have for from past experience of not of kind of granting saying hey we, we realize you tried to you made some mistakes but you tried to comply and that's what we look at and and i know it's kind of unknown question just curiosity from past experience i mean i think there's going to be a couple of things that are, are going to impact how ed is going to respond in those situations. And, and those are going to be, I think, the size of the institution itself. You know, I think an institution that's on the much smaller side is probably going to be able to, um, I don't want to say garner more sympathy, but I think the Department of Education is going to understand that it, it's going to be much harder for a, you know, an entity pulling in $100,000 a year in profit versus an entity that is massive and has campuses all across the country. I think there's going to be a little bit more um, leniency in, in that perspective. But, you know, I think it's also going to be a question of there, there could be issues if, if an institution was already kind of deemed a high risk institution from Department of Education standpoint, and then they get an agreement that required them to do certain things and and the institution you know doesn't have much a def of a defense as to why they didn't do something you know i think they're going to have to work a lot harder to explain things so the department of education doesn't you know deem them even higher risk um you know i think there, there's going to be a number of factors that are going to come into play there Thanks, Jana. Well, um, so Scott, it's good, good to have you back. So um, we're going to go back to section two. Um, I'll take the slides back for you. And so Scott's going to go through the six main um, requirements in, in the audit guide. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. Um, and apologies to everyone. Uh, I think I was a victim of some of the 
the, the technical issues that, that we had, and, and obviously there was no problem with the computer and everything doing our practice runs and everything like that, and it just kind of happened to pop up right before I was about to go on. So uh, Murphy's Law, but I'm happy to be with everyone here. Uh, thank you to Jana. Thank you for uh, to Ted and Mike and McClintock for the invitation. Um, this is, uh, I think, a really important topic, um, and I'm hopefully happy to, to explain as much as we can about something that <clears throat> might not be familiar to a lot of institutions on the call. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, and, and apologies again for going out of order, uh, is talk talk through the six compliance requirements kind of in the audit guide. So uh, for those of you who looked at the audit guide already, and I sure hope um, you, you have done that or are going to do that soon, um, there's six kind of specific compliance areas that uh, your auditors are going to be testing. Um, and just to, to back up, the, the, the basic reason here, um, the federal government has a responsibility to be effective stewards of taxpayer money. And so regardless of the, 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 the quickness and the speed and, and kind of the, 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 the way that this money was distributed, it's still taxpayer money. The federal government has rules uh, designed to kind of make sure that everything is, uh, is, is done according to, to federal government intent. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about here. These are the six areas that the federal government highlighted to, to test. Uh, so let's go to the first one. So activities allowed or unallowed. Um, here, the basic premise, auditors here are testing that your HERF grant funds were expended only for allowable activities. Um, and so I'll just briefly go through the, the allowable kind of uh, permissible purposes because it does change based on the act we're talking about and does get a little confusing. So we're talking about CARES Act funds. So funds that were distributed kind of at probably around April of 2020. Uh, the purpose in the Education Stabilization Fund is to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. Institutions were given two buckets of funds, student funds, and institutional funds under section 18004A1. So the student funds were for expenses related to the, the disruption of campus due to coronavirus, and the department listed a few eligible expenses. Uh, and these funds needed to be directly applied to students as grants. The institutional funds were provided um, to cover costs associated with significant changes to the, to the delivery of instruction due to coronavirus. So those were the basic definitions. As you know, we didn't get anything more from the statutory language. We got a little bit more from the department, but the devil was in the details here. And a lot of the questions that we had from clients were, what the heck does this mean? How can we apply this? And kind of doing our best to make sure that we're reasonable. But those are the main statutory thresholds that were determined to be what's allowable and not. And that's what um, auditors are looking with here. Um, in December, on December 7th, 2020, the CRRSAA was passed as part of the big omnibus bill. And part of what the CRRSAA SAA did, I don't know if there's a better acronym or way to say that, but um, Carissa, wh whatever that bill uh, did was expand the permissible uses of, uh, of her funds. So any funds, uh, any CARES Act funds not expended as of December 27, 2020, institutions were able to use for broader purposes allowed under the CRRSAA. And on the student side, that included any component uh, of a student's cost of attendance in addition to the emergency costs that arise out of coronavirus. And on the institutional side, uh, the, the, the allowability was, was really expanded, defraying expenses associated with coronavirus uh, and things like payroll and lost revenue and things that we were asking the department about through the CARES Act are now explicitly permissible. Um, so any funds spent after that, you have a much broader kind of discretion to use here. Um, we think this is a fairly low risk uh, um, endeavor. Uh, I think in, in response to the first poll question, a lot of institutions uh, on this call knew this guidance. They 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 had promulgated it. They're familiar with the FAQs and hopefully that they were uh, kind of following this this broad set. Of, of requirements. Uh, the second bucket we're going to talk about are the allowable costs and cost principles. And here we're trying to determine whether direct charges to the HERF program were for allowable costs and whether indirect costs were charged properly. Um, and the big threshold question here uh, are were, were the costs necessary, reasonable, allowable, 
and adequately documented. So for those that are not familiar with the distinction between direct and indirect costs, so direct costs are those that are kind of identified specifically and easily to the grant. Um, so an example in the HERF guide are financial aid grants to students. Those are an easy example of a direct costs. Indirect costs are, are, are a little trickier. They're, they're costs incurred for common of joint common or joint objectives and can't be identified specifically or easily for the grant. Um, so facilities costs, administrative costs might fit into that bucket. Uh, a lot of schools that we've dealt with did not have indirect costs and just kind of focused on the direct costs that were allowable under the previous section. Um, but for those that did have indirect costs, there's there's formulas, there's there's a lot of kind of guidance and and uh, and and thought that needs to go into making sure that those costs were adequately charged. So uh, the point of this uh, compliance piece here is to make sure that your direct charges were were allowable and your indirect charges were uh, were charged properly. Um, we think here there's a moderate risk for for institutions, uh, proprietary institutions, probably a limited experience with things like indirect costs, but to the extent that in, that proprietary institutions kind of stayed away from indirect costs and focused on direct costs uh, and used that guidance provided by Ed, um, we think there is some risk, but not the highest risk out of the out of the six buckets we have here. Hey, hey Scott, just to jump in one thing, and I'd say I've not seen anyone that claimed indirect costs. And if you followed Ed's guidance, that would all be direct costs. And so I think even in the situation where they said you could use it for professional services, if you got a legal bill for $1,000 for HERF consulting, that would be a direct cost, not an indirect cost, um, is our understanding of that. And so, so I just want to make that clarification for institutions. Now, if you got a legal bill that you had to split up and estimate, that is more of an indirect cost. But for I know where people claimed even professional services, they were direct bills solely for her for later where Edie said you can use it for. So I think this is really indirect. What I analogize it to the administrative cost allowance, the schools get in the campus-based program where it's really just kind of a broad estimate. And I didn't see anybody do that as well. Yeah, yeah no, that's a very helpful perspective. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, and, and so right, to the extent that you're, we're not talking about indirect costs, then you can kind of take off a couple pages of that HERF guide that, that deals with that specific area. Um, but, but right, to the extent that you're trying to charge building costs or heat or things like that, that then you might have to, to kind of check into those, those requirements. Um, 2 CFR uh, 20403, that's the requirement that I previewed, uh, just ensuring your costs are necessary, uniformly applied, uh, consi uh, treated consistently with accepted accounting principles. Um, that's that's kind of one of the main uh, pieces here um, that that is, is part of these uh, 2 CFR 200 Part E requirements with regard to cost principles. Um, the guide indicates uh, uh, 2 CFR 200.420 uh, uh, to uh, 476, and a couple of those examples are uh, are provided on the slide for you. Um, these are just general requirements um, that that institutions should be um, uh, following and should have followed as part of uh, as part of the award. Um, in addition to the the general uniform requirements, the guide also makes clear that there there are a few specific requirements in the higher education regulations sections, and those are flagged for you there. Uh, so for example, there's prohibitions on things like acquisitions of real property and proper construction, um, with the caveat there about things like uh, minor remodeling uh, definitions. Um, and uh, there's also specific prohibitions in the higher education space on things like alcohol or other charges um, like that that probably would not have addressed in, in this uh, grant funding, but that is a prohibition that uh, that does exist for institutions of higher education. Um, also important to flag uh, as part of this kind of 200.400 uh, series, uh, 2 CFR 200.407 traditionally requires prior written approval for certain expenditures. Um, so in Ed's uh, FAQs, um, recent FAQs uh, published recently in March, um, they explained that prior approval is, is traditionally required, but they've waived that requirement for um, the listed uh, 2 CFR 200 items in blue on the screen. So prior approval would not be required um, for those. And generally, that's not a requirement uh, that, that we have to worry about for, um, for these grant funds. So moving on, the third requirement is around earmarking. Um, we don't think this is a particularly high risk. Uh, most institutions we've we've talked to kind of have 
this one hopefully under control. Uh, at least 50% of her funds had to be used to provide emergency financial aid grants, financial aid grants to students. Um, an important piece here in the guidance, uh, there's no requirement for your auditors to test student eligibility. Here, we're truly just looking at the number of, uh, of, 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 of grant money as compared to your institutional funds um, to be spent on student aid grants. Um, and your main risk here, uh, if you expended 50% of the HERF-1 grant funds on institutional uses uh, and subsequently voided uncashed uh, HERF-1 student grant disbursements um, that weren't reissued. But we don't think that will be an issue for, for most schools, and hopefully this will be one that everyone passes with flying colors. Uh, the fourth requirement um, is the period of performance. Uh, so this basically means that whatever date was in your grant award notification, as the that's the period of performance you're permitted to use your HER funding, your your funds were were used within that um, within that uh, time period. Um, uh, I won't take credit for the the GAN anniversary. That's a McClintock trademark term, uh, but I like it. Uh, so basically, you have one year from the date your funds were awarded to, to spend it and just making sure that you stayed within that um, threshold. Uh, it's also important to note that you have 90 calendar days to liquidate your obligations um, as part of the grant closeout procedures. So uh, potentially, a lot of schools that that one year anniversary has elapsed or is about to elapse, uh, as long as the funds were uh, were, were, were dropped, were um, were allocated prior to that one year term, you have 90 days to kind of make liquid liquidate those payments and make final payments as well. Um, there's also a potential 12 month um, no cost extension you can get from the Department of Education, but those are discretionary and, and not guaranteed. And if, if you were gonna avail yourself of that option, hopefully you've already kind of talked to your grant award officer about that. Um, again, uh, we think this is low risk as, as most schools seem to be aware of this uh, timeframe. Um, but uh, to the extent that you have any um, questions about timing, this is one to, to take a look at because to, just to make sure that you're, you're really kind of within this one year period. The fifth uh, requirement that, that Jane has so uh, expertly um, uh, allocated uh, or explained uh, are the procurement, suspension, and debarment um, requirements. So I won't belabor this because I know you already heard Jana uh, give her great explanation. Um, but basically, compliance with the, the two CFR 200 requirements, uh, ensuring no one was suspended, debarred, or excluded um, from receiving federal funds for, for contractors that apply, um, and, and kind of making sure that schools are, are using, uh, are, are following the requirements. Um, one of the big ones that, that Gina talked about is, is having a documented procurement policy and procedure in place. Um, she talked about the specific types of contracts that need to be used depending on the amount of the grant and the type. Uh, that should all be detailed in your procurement policy and really to, to, to make sure that schools have, have a procurement file where they, they show kind of how they uh, took their policy, complied with it, and um, and kind of got to the right decision uh, and and the circumstance based on kind of the the written guidance that follows the the government procurement guidelines. Um, that's saying uh, a lot, uh, and I know that's easier said than done. And a lot of this webinar is based on those requirements. Um, so uh, we we think this is probably the highest risk of the of the six, just because a lot of proprietary schools just don't have experience with um, with these requirements. And and to, to be fair, the, the schools, the traditional schools that do have have government have offices kind of to deal with these uh, complex and esoteric requirements. So this is this is a this is a big one, making sure that you're kind of understand the requirements prior to your audit, understand that you have a procurement policy in place uh, and kind of going back and, and doing the best you can to show good faith effort and compliance um, if you think you you, you fell down a little bit based on those terms is, is all important things um, for this requirement. Uh, and the last um, is the reporting requirement. Uh, so Ed actually put down a, a really helpful site um, that, that lists out the reporting requirements. Uh, here you need to verify the timeliness, accuracy, and completeness um, of, of, uh, of the quarterly and annual reports. Uh, remember the quarterly reports need to be both for student and institutional um, funds. Uh, those need to be posted publicly on your website. The annual report was submitted to the Department of Education at the beginning of, of this year. 
Um, and auditors kind of just need to, to test and make sure that, that everything looks good, everything was published appropriately, and, and you hit all the, the right requirements. If you go to that Department of Ed website, that has a good explanation of kind of what was required. Um, and as long as you followed that, uh, you should be in, in good shape, but we think there's a fairly moderate risk because some of those uh, some of those items were were a little complex. Um, and so, with that really brief overview, um, I'll, I'll kick it back to to Mike. This quick question for you: One of the things that is not in here as a compliance requirement that I think many people expected, and even I did, is cash management. But it's not. So can you allude to maybe the fact maybe why Department of Ed didn't think that is one of the um, key items auditors need to test? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm always hesitant on trying to, 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 to know what the department's thinking or, or why they're doing things. But uh, potentially, I mean, it, it's a, it's a, the, the way that the funds were, were, were distributed um, could, could be uh, the department just did not think that that was a, a high risk in terms of the, 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 the type of compliance um, that, they're, that they're checking for. And also maybe not, not fair to kind of uh, to throw schools into the deep end on, on these requirements and kind of uh, expect those, those, um, th those requirements to be followed. Uh, I will mention though, that as part of the, the HERF FAQ roll-up, it did mention that when you're dispersing the, the student grants to, um, to, to, to students through debit cards and those kind of things, the Title IV uh, cash management principles did have to be um, applied. So even though uh, it's not specifically um, a, a compliance item tested, it is something that Ed uh, kind of thought enough to put in its um, FAQ document. And part of the, uh, the, the documents that every institution signed in order to get funds, uh, you would agree to the, the cash management principles from OMB. Um, so requirements are still out there, uh, but just don't have to worry about it as much for for this audit and they also in, in the carissa guidance they did kind of highlight drawing down the money more specifically than they did with the herf one money as well make just kind of reminding schools of that okay. right. um thanks scott and i realize yeah i'm not trying to understand what ed's thinking it was was not meant to be a loaded question but appreciate the <laughs> answer so we're going to um, go to section four i'm going to turn it back to ted to kind of talk about a little bit about the audit reports and the corrective action plans and then we'll circle back and and answer some Q and A. Scott and Jana, appreciate that. Uh, part of what we're going to be doing, uh, let me just get to the reporting slides. There we go. Um, just want to talk briefly about the audit reports and the corrective action plans that need to be submitted. The audit report that's going to be submitted to the department is going to be very similar to that of the uh, student financial aid compliance audits. Um, our report will have an opinion, and this opinion will be on the institution's compliance or non-compliance with the HERF grant requirements, those six requirements which uh, Scott had just uh, recently outlined for us. Uh, all the instances of non-compliance uh, must be reported. And with regard to those uh, findings, um, they should include criteria for a specific requirement on, on which the finding is based. Um, the, should disclose the criteria, condition, cause, effect, and order's recommendation and views of the responsible officials, which is very similar to what is required for the student financial aid compliance audit. And the finding we should be reporting you know, if applicable, if it relates to expenditures or grants that are in error, we have to report what the uh, dollar amount is, as well as the population and sample size that was tested must be uh, disclosed as well. And again, that's very similar to the uh, compliance audits. With regard to the corrective action plans, again, somewhat similar to the uh, compliance audit, there are a couple of little different nuances. So for any of the audit findings, uh, the school must prepare the corrective action plan, uh, must be on the letterhead signed by the responsible official, and the guide defines that responsible official as the person who actually prepares the CAP. CAP must include the contact information of the responsible official, uh, applicable title, telephone number, and email address. Uh, the CAP should indicate whether the responsible official concurs or doesn't occur with the finding, along with actions taken or planned actions to correct the finding. 
And that, that requirement is, is, again, these requirements are very typical to what's uh, in the corrective action plan for the student financial aid compliance audit. The main difference will be the, the last bullet point. For planned actions um, taken, you, we need to include the anticipated completion date within the corrective action plan. So if you haven't taken any corrective action with a specific uh, finding, but have planned corrective actions, you need to indicate what date uh, the anticipated completion of that corrective action uh, will occur. So that's pretty much it as far as the reports and the corrective action plans are concerned. I'm going to turn it back to Mike. Thanks, Ted. Um, one question we've Ted and I've been talking about, and I'm just going to have you allude to it is. One of the things, I think one of the harder things we'll have to test and audit is thinking through the single source documentation. Um, and so in, in the sense of, you know, a client can write up their answer single source, but do we need any external support um, to, to validate that the conclusions were correct and we're in agreement with them? So Ted, do you have any thoughts on that item? Yeah, I think if um, in particular, this is going to relate more to the higher dollar purchases that are being made. And as far as any external documentation is concerned, I think it might be if you're, for example, if you're looking to purchase a certain equipment and you need certain uh, specifications as it relates to the equipment that you're purchasing, um, that there will be some indication on the either invoice that you received from the vendor or indication that other vendors that you might have um, gone to did not uh, enable you to get those specific specifications that you required for that piece of equipment. So having that documentation, having an indication, here is why um, we you selected that vendor in particular and to the um, rationale and reasoning for uh, that selection, you know, as long as that's documented um, substantially, then uh, you should be in compliance with that. Yeah, I think as we were talking, the cost differential, you know, kind of as Jana was saying, is part of it as well. If you're talking two items and the cost differential is a thousand on a hundred thousand dollar purchase, that's not a whole lot. But if it's twenty five thousand dollars and you went with a higher one, I think that's going to maybe there is some external support that you need. So it's kind of a facts and circumstances test, but consider that. Um, so we're going to move to q and I do want to thank our speakers for their knowledge and provide an overview of the guide's key takeaways. A um, little shameless plug, we did an article for career education review on this audit guide, and so that will be released in May. And at the end of the webinar, you're going to be directed to the article where it's posted on our website as well. So it's out there. So you can start reading through this again because there's a lot to digest at one time. Uh, we do have several questions that have come through, so we're going to attempt to answer those. Um, and we are, we'll try to answer your questions. If we aren't able to get back to you today, uh, please feel free to reach out to any one of us as well. Um, so first question I've got is, is one for you, Scott, uh, think through allow, this is kind of allowable cost or period of performance for people that you paid for licensing fees, uh, related to say an OMS system, you know, year one, you paid for in the pandemic and the whole pandemic was going on, but now you paid for year two before your GAN date's done. So it's clearly before the GAN date's over, but assuming the national emergency is over at the end of 2021, that licensing fee will carry past the GAN date and probably past the end of the national emergency. So is, is it allowable to claim the whole second year cost because it did happen? I think there, for me, I know there's some uncertainty of what's allowable under the federal regs in that situation. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, let, let me actually get Jana's thoughts on that before I, because uh, I think she might have the, the, the more uh, government contracts focused answer. Yeah, I mean, I think there's going to be a couple of things that come into play. One of them may be what the standard term is that you could have negotiated. If all you could get for a, a license is a an annual license, I think it's more likely to be an allowable cost. If, however, you had the capability to negotiate on a month by month basis, um, you know, I think that there's more of a question there. Um, but typically, you know, the a cost is going to be allowable after it's incurred. So even if you pay for the license before you've incurred the costs, you're actually only incurring the costs 
for as you're using the license you've just made the payment up front so i think you know typically it would be unallowable but there may be some situations where it could be um allowable and i mean there may be some precedent on it but that's kind of my off the the cuff thinking on on how it may be treated because i do think you know especially if you need something for the eight months of you know that we are still kind of in a mostly remote um, situation and you could only buy it on an annual basis I, I think that is much more of an argument at least um, for an institution to make as for why the entire amount needs to be allowable and and that's helpful because I have also talked to institutions about using something like DocuSign where you pay for a amount of it but then you use it up as you go along and we've kind of said in that case you can maybe only claim what you've used through the grant date because it's a little bit different. It almost goes to your monthly answer. So I, I think that's that clarity is helpful. Um, Jana, this may be you again, or Scott, is one of the questions that came through. Just for the grant or for all purchases on a sample? Um, so, I, I mean, I think that if, if I understood your correct question correctly, it's, does the procurement policy have to apply just to procurements under the federal award or does it have to apply to all procurements by the campus? Is that the question? I, I think that's right, as you say, as you say, it's so obviously it would not apply to purchases outside what you're using for the grant funds, correct? Typically, yes. Um, well, the. I should say at least, you know, the government's not really going to be looking at the procurements beyond um the, the grant funds but you know if an institution already had procurement policies and procedures in place because they just had decided to do that which a number of um institutions may have done you know they may have had kind of a a, a very brief manual for their purchasing department that's something that probably could have sufficed on a number of these things as long as it was adapted to meet the federal requirements okay. um okay i think um so I think some of the items, I, as far as like the the exact competitive bids and all that, if it's not for a federal grant, most schools aren't complying with that, nor do they have to. So correct. Um, so Ted, one of the questions that came in, and, and we know this is a question we're going to get, is can we fix issues such as check and SAM before the audit? And I know we we've had conversations. I um, Department of Ed certainly did say in their June and October webinars that we, they realized schools were not familiar with the guidance, that they wanted to get out there fast. They did reinforce that schools should be following it, but there does seem to be some, some ability to make sure this is all documented before mm -hmm. you begin the audit. I think once the audit begins, it becomes a much harder if things aren't available. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think what we are, you know, wanted to see and want to emphasize as well is, you know, prior to the audit beginning, you know, going back and making certain that the documentation is uh, being followed. Um, a lot of these, some of these procedures, the institution already has in place. It's just documenting what some of those are with regard to uh, the disbarment uh, provisions and so forth. I think if they go back and make a good faith effort and document that, yes, indeed, this um, vendor was not uh, disbarred, or uh, then I, I think you know that would meet the uh, requirement. Had a number of schools kind of come to us after the guide was uh, was completed and and kind of asked the same question. Um, and there's nothing you can do about what happened kind of prior um, but all you can do uh, I think is as Ted was alluding to is 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 really show your good faith compliance and that you you now understand you didn't you, you didn't understand the rules for for whatever reason but the second you did the second you were on notice you you made um, a good faith effort to, to kind of go back and, and and check go back and create a procurement file go back and put a policy in place um, and uh, hopefully that will uh, that will kind of uh, if if not reduce or just kind of show your your good faith um, going forward and that you're you're being a good steward of, of the government funding you received. 
Mm-hmm. And I and I think from talking to schools, a number of them, you know, when they've made especially more significant purchases, you know, maybe an increasement of their LMS system. When they bought the original LMS system, they they did a very lengthy process to evaluate who it was, and so it may be informal. And so now that when they had to expand that in COVID, they didn't have to, but they had the knowledge. It may just be very informal memos or emails. It's a matter of just pulling that together. It's not like they didn't have any real thought process and go through that. And, and so it's just kind of coalescing that into a more formal document that that's clear. Yeah. Um, and I think yeah, the one right. thing I would add to all of this is to make sure though, that whatever you're creating at this point or gathering, it reflects that you're creating it at this point. It's not dated, you know, May 6, 2020, yeah. as though you had done those things then, it, you know, just document that you are, um, you know, uh, uh, recording the justification that you had when you made that purchase in May of 2020. Um, you know, make sure that your documents reflect that the the true times that they happen because you don't want to be accused of misleading um, the Department of Education or a representative from the Department of Education in your documentation. Yeah, I'd agree. I think you're much better. I think it goes back to the intent and whether the cost was allowable. If the cost was allowable and all your documentation supports that through all the procurement and that that documentation was just done later, that to me, that certainly seems like a situation where a school shouldn't be penalized from it. You know, and, and, and But you don't want them, Department of Ed or Nardo, to assume the intent otherwise, because if they get concerned on intent, that's when people start digging more. Um, it, it's worse. Exactly. Yeah, it does. It looks worse, even if it's not. It's perception. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things, a question that came through, um, if they re- a school received gear funding, that that's not included in this audit threshold. And Ted, I think that'd be, that'd be correct. There's nothing in this audit guide relating to the gear funding that is funding that came through from the states out to the institutions. That is, that's my understanding. Yep. So yeah, and that, and just as a side note, I've not seen any type of audit requirements for the gear funding, um, but certainly not in this audit guide. Another question we've, that came through and we've got asked this saying, is it appropriate to fund the HERF audit from the remaining institutional funds? So I'll pose that to Jana or Scott. I guess the question it could be is the period of performance that it may be allowable, on the, but I'm not sure the audit may be done in time under the, the period of performance would be my concern. Yeah, and I'll actually grab this one. Um, the, there's a, and I made sure to look it up. Uh, there, there's a, a letter um, announcing the audit guide that Ed put out on March uh, 8th. Um, and it just kind of explains for, for uh, proprietary and non-proprietary institutions, um, the, a few basic FAQs. Uh, and, it's, and one of the FAQs is how can we pay for the audit? Um, it explains that proprietary institutions can use a reasonably proportionate share of reasonable costs associated with the implementation of the audit requirement. Um, so, so not not student aid funds, institutional funds, but um, so it is possible. Um, but I think your point, Mike, is very well taken. That uh, it's 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 even though it's theoretically possible, it might not be actually possible for your institution. So I'd encourage the the poster to to read that letter and the requirements and kind of make sure that they understand that the dates applicable to their awards. Yeah, and I think I'd go back and look um, and look at the lost revenue guidance and if there's other ways to claim it. I think it's a lot clear and if i guess if you get to the point you can't claim any more institutional funds it, maybe you've had a pretty good year and it's just safer not to try to claim stuff that starts getting gray because it goes back to that perception and intent again so yeah. Dana? and from a procurement standpoint i would also add that i don't uh, that generally audit services to be allowable they still need to follow the procurement standards so they would still need to be acquired using one of those methods of procurement that we talked about either um Micro purchase, which I suspect that these audits are probably exceeding ten thousand um, dollars. I could be wrong, um, but if it's a sm- um, under the simplified acquisition threshold, um, the two hundred fifty thousand dollars threshold, then you know you'd still need to be following that method of procurement that's set out. If if it is going to be charged to the federal award. I'd say if we have an audit that ends up being over $250,000, I doubt we're going to get out but by July because it's going to have a lot of issues in it. So uh, so, um, so the question, another one came through is, when is this first audit due on Easy Audit? The institution's FSA audit was conducted in April 2021. So, Ted, do you want to – I could go back to those slides even um, 
if that's well, no, I, I think we can, you know, explain it. So the due date is uh, July 29th of uh, 2021. So if you've already submitted your uh, compliance audit and financial statement audit already through Easy Audit, then you can submit it once the um, perf uh, audit is done. If you have not submitted those um, yet, then you can submit the HERF grant audit with your uh, normal uh, compliance audit. So if you are December 31st, uh, 2020 year end and your submission is due on June 30th of 2021, you can submit your financial statement audit, your compliance audit, and your HERF grant audit along with that, with the same easy audit submission. But again, if you have not, you would submit that uh, separately, as I mentioned uh, previously, and, and treat it as a, a, a stub audit with regard to the type of submission through Easy Audit. So, yeah, I think the, the key piece is to know when is your HERF audit going to get done. If, and, and if it's get done before June 30th, you may just want to wait for one submission. If your auditor says it's not going to get done to July, then I'd get your normal December submission done. No sense sitting on it in most cases and then submit the HERF audit at a later time. Mm -hmm. So just hanging on, I, I don't see any other questions that have come through, and we are at 310. We were scheduled to go to 315. So I'm, I'll kind of close here, and if any other questions come in, we can answer them. Um, just want to let people know that M McClintock is certainly performing these HERF audits, and Thompson Coburn, as Scott alluded to, is assistant schools preparing for it. Um, we thank you so much for joining us today. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be sharing a recording of today's session, so you can re-listen at any point. And again, we apologize for any um, software errors um, that the provider had, and, and hopefully the recording, you can go back and listen to it again for those of you who may have been cut off. Um, thank you again for your participation and all you do to help students. We wish you a healthy and safe path ahead. Perfect. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.